Dr. William S. Jordan, Jr. is the director of the Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Program for the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, one of the government's national institutes of health. Uh, now, Dr. Jordan, what is the difference between infectious and communicable diseases? Well, let's start with communicable diseases first. Communicable diseases are what the name suggests. In other words, they are spread from person to person by contact. Most of the childhood diseases, such as measles, chickenpox, German measles, fall into this category. Infectious diseases include communicable diseases, but also all other diseases that we think of as being caused by microorganisms, either bacteria or viruses. For example, we would say that a person who has a boil caused by a, a germ that produces a pus when infecting the skin has an infectious disease. But uh, this person is not usually communicable in the sense that boils are catching. Would you explain the difference, say, between a viral disease and a bacterial disease? Well, the microorganisms that are studied by investigators who are called microbiologists fall into a number of categories. The two major ones are bacteria and viruses. Bacteria can grow and multiply on what we call artificial media or in broth cultures, whereas viruses grow inside of cells. They are much smaller, much less complex organisms. Over the years, we've seen the development of numerous antibiotics. Now, because of these antibiotics, physicians have an effective means for treating and controlling most bacterial diseases. Why is it that antibiotics do not cure or control viral diseases? Well, that actually relates to the property that I mentioned before. Because viruses grow inside cells and are dependent on the metabolic activity of these cells, it's very hard to damage viruses without damaging the cell in which they grow. This has made the search for antiviral agents much more difficult than the search for the antibiotic agents that act against the bacteria. Uh, recently, scientists at the University of California in San Francisco reported a spectacular success in inoculating a group of 77 youngsters with the type of pneumonia vaccine. Now, doesn't your institute, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, did you, aren't you quite uh, responsible in, in a way for this particular development? Yes, our institute played a major role in the development and the testing of this vaccine. This vaccine is a pneumococcal vaccine, and as a matter of fact, was just recently licensed. It was developed to prevent a kind of pneumonia caused by a bacterium called the pneumococcus because of its association with pneumonia. And the vaccine appears to be about 80% effective in preventing pneumonia due to the antigens in this particular vaccine. Children who have sickle cell disease or degree or trauma, because they have lost their spleen, either because of the disease, sickle cell anemia, or by through surgery, are unusually prone to infection with the pneumococcus. The study that you mentioned showed that in a small number of children with sickle cell disease or splenic dysfunction, when compared with those who are normal, uh, have more pneumococcal infections than the, than the normal, and that those that had the vaccine were protected against this kind of infection. Now, this uh, particular vaccine that you're speaking of, uh has been licensed now. Well, does that mean it's going to be available shortly? How soon will that vaccine be available? I you? understand it'll, that it should be on the mar uh, on the shelf uh, after the first of the year. Oh, good. Well, here's one you probably get a lot. How far are we away from finding a cure for the common cold? <laughs> well, we're a long way away. The and we might say we are a victim of our own success in that regard. The reason is that we think of the common cold as a single entity, whereas it's a multiple entity. There are many, many viruses that cause symptoms that we would classify as the common cold. The nose has a limited capacity to respond to a variety of things, and many things will make it 
make us sneeze and have a runny nose. There are a group of viruses called rhinoviruses, which are the most common cause of the common cold, but there are about 80 of these viruses. And to make a vaccine that would have that many viruses in it, it would be extremely difficult. Also, for the reasons that we mentioned in terms of antivirals, uh, it's very hard to, to find chemical compounds that act against viruses. And so the, the, the notion of finding a cure or a preventive either through a, through a form of a vaccine is going to take a lot more effort. Now, almost every year we seem to be bracing ourselves for a new and supposedly different kind of influenza epidemic. Why haven't scientists come up with one vaccine that would be effective against all types of influenza? The influenza virus is very unique among viruses in that it has the capacity to change its antigenic coat. We make uh, vaccines by producing antigens from organisms that cause disease. And measles vaccine will work and will work uh, this year and next year and 10 years from now because the measles virus is stable in the sense that it its antigen is the same now as it was in the past and will be in the future. So there's only one measles virus. I mentioned a while ago that there may be 80 rhinoviruses, that, and that causes a problem because of the great number of antigens you would have to have. The influenza virus undergoes what we call antigenic drift or antigenic shift due to forces that we don't fully understand so that the vaccine we make this year with this year's virus may not work two years from now because by that time the influenza virus has changed. This is a property particularly of what we call the influenza A viruses, which is, and it's the A influenza virus that's responsible for the major epidemics and worldwide pandemics. And we've heard reports on individuals who have developed serious medical problems following inoculation with the swine flu vaccine. Now, how dangerous are flu shots, generally speaking? The complication that you referred to was recognized during the swine flu immunization program. It was a peculiar neurological disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome. The etiology of this disease is not known. Cases occur constantly in the population. It may be due to a yet unrecognized virus. And it does seem that a number of things will provoke the occurrence of this disease. The fact that influenza vaccine may have induced it or provoked it uh, in the fall of 76 was recognized because the individuals who were given vaccine were very closely followed and the nation had established a surveillance system. We would not have recognized this uh, complication otherwise. This complication occurred in about one in 120,000 people in certain age groups who had gotten the vaccine. You're listening to an interview with Dr. William S. Jordan, Jr. of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, one of the federal government's national institutes of health. We were talking about flu shots just a moment ago. Who should receive flu shots? The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends that individuals over 65 and those in certain high-risk groups be immunized. Now, those in the high-risk groups have a variety of illnesses which would predispose them to more severe complications of influenza, including secondary bacterial infections, which influenza predisposes to. And these are people who have, particularly who have uh, chronic lung disease, such as bronchitis, or chronic heart, heart disease, which compromises the pulmonary function. There are also uh, recommendations that suggest that individuals who are key folks within the, the provision of community services, such as policemen, and farm, hospital employees, and such groups as that, should uh, deserve special consideration. Well, Dr. Jordan, would you tell us something about the microbiology and infectious diseases program of uh, your institute, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and what kind of research are you emphasizing at this time? The microbiology and infectious diseases program is concerned with broad-ranging research 
from what we would call as basic through the developmental activities onto application. And an example of this is the pneumococcal vaccine you mentioned recently. And our goal is the control and prevention of infectious diseases, and of which there are a great many in this country and uh, particularly throughout the rest of the world where infectious diseases are still the leading cause of death. To control or prevent an infectious disease, it's necessary first to identify the agent that causes that disease. The disease would be recognized clinically by the physician. Then the laboratory would uh, work to isolate the causative agent. Some of these agents have been known for a long, long time, and others are just being recognized. Legionnaire's disease is an example of one just recently recognized. The next steps are to be able to grow this agent, either a bacterium or a virus or a fungus or a parasite, in the laboratory so that you can understand its behavior and then use the materials from this organism to prefer to develop tests so that you can recognize other cases of this disease. And this again has been exemplified by the Legionnaire's disease problem. Other examples recently are the discovery of very serious virus infections in parts of Africa, which cause very high fatality rates. Having isolated the organism, having understood it, having been able to use it to recognize other cases to make laboratory diagnosis, then one approach would be to test it if it's a bacterium against sensitivity to available antibiotics to learn what the proper treatment is, or to try to make a vaccine with it. And in the case of viruses, again, uh, see what class of virus it falls into, which helps us understand something about the disease, whether it's likely to be produce a lifelong immunity or not, whether a vaccine is likely to work if we could get the virus to grow properly and produce a vaccine with it. The uh, association of viruses and bacteria with chronic disease as well as acute disease are, is also of interest to the Institute, and there is some evidence that some of the diseases that we have not thought of as being infectious in the past indeed may be infectious, and the, the challenge is to find the tools to identify the agents that are involved. Well, most of us think of herpes as simply being the familiar cold sores around the mouth type, but lately we've been hearing a great deal about the sexually transmitted herpes. Is this the same kind of virus? It's in the same category of virus, the, but it can be separated from the cold sore virus, which we classify as herpes simplex and or herpes type 1 uh, by, in the laboratory. And the organism that usually infects the genital tract is called herpes genitalis or herpes type 2. How much of a problem is it for various nations in preventing people from bringing uh, communicable diseases into a country? Well, it is a serious problem, and uh, with the rapidity of air travel, uh, it's not uncommon for an individual to move from one continent to another uh, within the space of 24 hours. And of course, if an incubation period for a disease is longer than that, he may be infected in one country and get sick in another. We're familiar with this happening in the past with people who get malaria in parts of the world where they have malaria and have their first episode of malaria in the United States. Thank you, Doctor. You've been listening to an interview with Dr. William S. Jordan, Jr. of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, one of the National Institutes of Health. Do you know the difference between the usual type of community hospital and a hospital that is devoted entirely to research on patients. At the National Institutes of Health, Mrs. Catherine Himmelsbach, who is head of a team of social workers in the cancer section of the NIH Clinical Center, a research hospital, explains the differences. Our patients are chronically ill people with a form of cancer which is under study at 
the National Cancer Institute. They are admitted only for the disease which is under study. Therefore, there are research implications to this, i.e., no cure yet for what I have, will I be a guinea pig, and many other questions of this kind. There is no charge for hospitalization. No procedure is done without the patient's permission. Uh, they stay for periods of 30 days to months. Uh, because of this, there is a feeling of belonging, but at the same time, there are geographical distances from home, which create uh, feelings of loneliness, often rejection. They are subject to additional procedures by virtue of the research project. They're encouraged to be up and dressed, contrary to what many sometimes think when they come only with pajamas and robe. There is the freedom of the uh, NIH to them, including many resources such as library, cafeteria, beauty shop, chaplain service, uh, recreational facilities. All of these research projects are carefully screened so that maximum knowledge may be obtained with minimum risk to the patient and with ongoing treatment throughout. Now you have at the clinical center all ages, don't you? Indeed from infants, from almost newborn infants, uh, to geriatric patients. Uh, anyone who has a disease that is of interest is under study and for which they are deemed to be eligible. Now, the, the physicians of the patients have to recommend the patients. These, these patients are referred mission. by a yeah. referring physician to yeah. whom they are referred back when the project is ended. Now, while the patients are taking part in the research projects at the clinical center, are they also being treated for the disease or disability that has brought them there? They are given maximum treatment in terms of the best knowledge available. Now, what are some of the characteristics of patients who are admitted to the clinical center as different from other uh, hospital patients? Well, first of all, uh, as indicated earlier, all of these patients are chronically ill. They have as, an, as yet, quote, incurable disease they have different expectations. They often say, this is my last hope. Um, they have a feeling of obligation to the hospital because of the fact that the hospitalization is free. And indeed, many patients will say, I'm delighted now to pay my taxes because of the tremendously wonderful care that I'm getting here. Uh, because of the greater length of stay, again, there is this feeling of belonging, but at the same time, there's this long time absence from home, which often necessitates relatives being maintained by the social work department in the area uh, to lend mor moral support. Would this be especially true uh, in the case of ch children patients? This is so especially the family true. could be nearby. Indeed. Yeah. Especially true in the case of children where really the uh, accessibility of the, pa of the parent is essential. Now, you uh, get patients from all over the country, I understand. All over the country and foreign countries in, as well provided they meet the, um, the criteria. When we were talking before, you mentioned an instance of a woman who came from Appalachia, which I thought was a very touching story. Indeed. We have many uh, wonderful patients uh, who come from uh, the various mountainous and rural areas of our country uh, to whom the clinical center uh, and its environs is a real uh, revelation. Uh, this particular lady, uh, needed to come to the clinical to do N NCI for treatment. She was referred by her doctor. She was without funds. Um, they passed a handkerchief around in her little community church uh, group and put enough money in it for her uh, transportation. Uh, the regulation is that the, the first travel costs here and back should be uh, met by the patient or by a community resource if that can be found. Thereafter, as needed, uh, the government affords transportation because our patients do need to come and go um, very, very much. And it would be almost impossible even for an affluent person to cover all the transportation costs throughout their entire period of treatment. And uh, the coming and the going also relates to the research project. In Indeed. That the, the scientists who are working on the project want to follow the patient through the different stages, and that would account for some of the back and forth. Indeed, our patients come, uh, treatment is intermittent often, uh, it's very strenuous, it may be radiation, it may be chemotherapy, it may be a combination of that with immunological uh, intervention. And this requires a great deal of coming and going over a period of time. And many, uh, we follow our patients for many years, some of them. 
Now, for those patients who are not fatally ill, what determines how long they might stay at the clinical center? Uh, they will stay throughout the period of the uh, particular research protocol. They are then referred back uh, to their uh, referring physician, as I said. Now, throughout this period of so-called hospitalization, they go through many stages, the pre-admission stage in which we determine um, the, their situation prior to coming, the inpatient stage, uh, at some point during the inpatient stage when they are deemed uh, medically eligible, they are uh, then referred to our so-called special ambulatory care program, familiarly known as SAC, and this means residents in a very nearby motel coming in daily for diagnostic evaluation and treatment as indicated and then the outpatient status when they just come in for maybe a day or two days. Well, now, when the patients are discharged or when they are leaving uh, for a, a certain length of time, knowing that they'll have to come back, what do you, as the social worker working with those cancer patients, do for the patient at that point? Well, very early in the stage of the patient's admission, we begin to think about discharge because we know that ideally the patient will be returning to his home community, if at all possible. Uh, so very early in the game, we get to know their social history. We get to know the resources of their community and their needs. It may be that they will need home care when they return. This is arranged, visiting nurse service. It may be that they In other words, you arrange We arrange that. all of this. Yes, from the clinic. Our, our central yeah. role is to maintain the social functioning of this patient, whether he's with us or whether he is at home, and to enable him to persist in that role as long as possible, irrespective of his condition. So we, we must have a wide knowledge of community resources, and we must utilize this. Uh, we make quite sure that this patient, not only from the standpoint of his, his transportation home, but when he gets home, that there will be all kinds of built-in supports that he needs. He may be well enough to go back to work, but at a different kind of work by virtue of an amputation or whatever. So we arrange then for vocational rehabilitation, retraining, and uh, so that he may be trained for a job for which he is equipped. Now, is that rehabilitation and retraining paid for by the government? That is paid for. That is the vocational rehabilitation service of I the see. United okay. States government. Federal government, yeah. Now, you work with uh, the cancer patients, and could you tell us what special problems you encounter with cancer patients? Well, in our culture, unfortunately, despite the tremendous advances that have been and are being made, cancer connotes death so that the first diagnosis of cancer is, produces great fear. And this can persist, feelings of isolation, of rejection, uh, the tremendous pain which can ensue, the disfigurement which may be a result of uh, head or neck surgery or amputations of other kinds. Uh, patients experience great feelings of anger. This is one way of handling their anxiety or depression which is turning that anxiety inward. Sometimes they become quite immobile they experience uh, tremendous fear of dependency and often uh, over-dependency reactions. Um, the family's reactions also uh, are very catastrophic in terms of fears of contagion, of inherited traits, well I get this too because mother has it, and so on. Uh, also the, par the, pa the relatives have a very realistic fear of assuming long-term care of the patient, and this makes them feel very guilty. All of these feelings need to be handled. One of the most devastating, however, of the reactions to the cancer patient, which affect him and his family, is the reaction of the community in general. There is a singular lack of understanding of cancer in the community, and uh, even longtime friends and neighbors, patients tell us, will reject them, will indicate uh, real prejudice and discrimination against them. This has been particularly marked with our children, our leukemic children in remission, who are germ-free, who are well, and who can no longer play with a longtime playmate. This is a heartbreak, and uh, we really need much more um, interpretation in the community for this. Um, these people need so much to have someone who can uh, be close to them, who can accept them in spite of the terrible mutilation that they may undergo, or to who can accept the inner pain which they have. And this, this is uh, important. This is the emotional support that's needed. And then, of course, the tremendous environmental support, as I've said, for community resources. Many of our patients, even those who have been affluent, 
uh, had become medically indigent by virtue of this debilitating disease and uh, do need environmental supports, money as well. Well, now, in dealing with these very special problems which the cancer patients have, what are some of the uh, characteristics that are required in the social workers who have to cope with this day after day? Well, I feel that the cancer social worker must be a, a rather a different kind of social worker. First of all, he or she must be able to face serious illness and death, which is probably the most intimate experience that one can share with another human being. Uh, this means not running away when somebody needs to talk about this. And uh, often there is this real uh, feeling that one wants to run away because it's so, so threatening. There must be a philosophical acceptance of the qualitative aspects of life because indeed each day is important. People do not want to talk about their death constantly. They do not want to wallow in this. There may be one time in a relationship when they want to break down and really talk about this. But the rest of the time they like to live as fully as they can, and this is part of our job, to accept them as people and to help them to live as fully as they can until they die. It is important to be able to be the patient's advocate, and often this takes a great deal of courage because one must uh, face up to the medical team, one must be willing to interpret to them the needs of this patient, however trying this patient may seem to be from the standpoint of the medical team. Uh, there must be a really deep understanding of family dynamics in order to understand what's really going on between this patient and those nearest and dearest to him. Because all sorts of old grievances and old uh, grudges and unresolved uh, guilt uh, comes to the forefront at, the time, at a time of this kind, whether the patient is dying or whether there's just the fear of death. Uh, we must recognize these barriers of secrecy often where they cannot talk to each other and uh, they may come in the room and say how well you look today Joe knowing that he looks perfectly ghastly and he knows it and the conspiracy of silence which goes on which keeps these people from being close to each other mm -hmm. uh, and they need so much to be close to each other. The cancer social worker must be a particularly empathetic individual. Empathetic, not sympathetic uh, because it, without this uh, these are very sensitive people. Their antenna are very sensitive. Uh, whether their time is more limited than ours or not is really not known because we're all terminal. And I think this is very important for us to keep in mind. It's just a matter of knowing the length of the time. So it behooves us to make the most of each day. And I think one of the things that keeps us going, really, uh, in the face of a great deal of stress here, is the hope which permeates uh, the Cancer Institute. Uh, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, patients and their families. They come for help and they have hope and we all have to share this. Now in addition to all those responsibilities, the social workers do participate in a way in the research protocol itself. Is that not so? We, I feel that we enable the patients to cope with the stress of the research experience. Uh, this research experience requires many additional procedures. It involves changes in body image uh, by virtue of the chemotherapy, radiation and surgery. Uh, by helping patients to relate to one another both in an individual and group way, we enable them to maintain maximum social functioning so that they can cooperate in the research effort. In addition to that, I've been fortunate enough to be on the uh, clinical review board so that I know personally the care with which these protocols are chosen. Thank you very much, Mrs. Himmelsbach. This has been an interview with Mrs. Catherine Himmelsbach who is Chief of the Cancer Social Work Section at the National Institute of Health Clinical Center in Bethesda, Maryland.